Yeah, thanks so much. Um, hello, everybody, and good afternoon uh, to the session. Um, I think we can already start. Uh, I'm not going to, I think what I will actually do is uh, probably just give a very quick round of introductions. Uh, each of us introduce uh, ourselves. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have one of the panelists. Um, and so we are basically running the show with two panelists and myself as moderator. Uh, I look at financial systems, um, financial systems design related issues, mostly focused in India, uh, have about 15 years of experience looking at uh, how could the nature of uh, sort of regulated interactions right between various supply side actors uh, result in inclusion outcomes, well being outcomes, financial well being outcomes for low income individuals at the last mile. Um, but uh, we, I certainly don't want to treat loan income individuals as a separate category. Uh, financial services, if it works for everybody above them, uh, that's a big challenge there to actually then think of uh, what's the last mile looking like. So to that extent, a lot of issues that we are seeing uh, or certain policy related design issues that we are seeing are equally applicable to anyone else, um, even up the, up the channel too. Um, but uh, so that's really just about me. Uh, this is a topic uh, which um, Consumers International has uh, sort of very kindly uh, sort of required of me to uh, moderate and I've learned a lot uh, in that process. Uh, so I look forward to an engaging discussion. Uh, I'll request Yo Kyung to introduce yourself. Okay, okay. Hello, um, my name is Yu Kyung Ha. I am uh, the director of Digital and Financial Regulatory Policy of Consumers Korea. It's great to meet everybody in this session. I can see that everybody's um, full of digital finance at this point. So Consumers International had so many sessions of digital finance. And right now, we're, I think we're on the last mile, the most, I think, difficult subject maybe for consumer advocates about crypto. Um, just to give a little bit background of myself, I am a um, researcher, I'm a lawyer. Um, I've worked about 15 years um, in financial regulation. I worked a few years in the Korean Financial Supervis Supervisory Service. And yes, I'm so happy to meet everybody here. Thank you. Thanks, Yong Kyo. I'm requesting uh, Senator Barry, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you. Hello, good day. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you to Consumers International for the invite to be here. My name is Barry Griffin. I am the Vice President of the Senate in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, but I am also a practicing financial services attorney here in the Bahamas who specializes in the realm of commercial law, but um, also most recently digital asset law. Um, so I'm very happy to be here um, in both capacities as a legislator here in the Bahamas um, to speak about the DARE Act and what we're doing here, but also as a practitioner in this space. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. All right. So um, I think this, uh, there's a challenge ahead of me to make sure that uh, I do this as interactive as possible. So uh, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions in terms of show of hands. Uh, how many of you... Uh, uh, would consider yourself an expert on um, blockchain. Okay. Uh, how many of you would consider yourself as a, um, as investors in uh, stocks? Do any of you hold at least a single stock in a public listed company? All right. How many of you hold uh, at least one bond, a publicly traded bond? Okay, I'm also going to involve, include myself. Okay. All right. Uh, how many of you have term deposits in banks? Okay. Um, how many of you uh, have invested in chit funds or so Roscas? Roscas. Okay. What are they called? Rotation savings and credit associations. Like. Uh, you know, small groups where savings are mixed with credit. Uh, so these are uh, so-called informal, but they are highly sophisticated instruments that are very prevalent in the informal sector. Okay. Uh, how many of you have invested in pyramid schemes or Ponzi schemes? All right. Um, how many of you know of someone who's lost money to a Ponzi scheme? Okay. How many of you knew, uh, know at least one person who has invested in Bitcoin? Wow. Yeah? 
That's great. Okay. Uh, wow. So would that include crypto or just Bitcoin? Just Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Okay. How many of you know of at least one person invested in stable coins? Any of the what's called stable coins? I don't know what's stable about them, but okay. How many of you have invested in gold as an instrument? How many of you have invested in uh, sort of the gold paper, which is right, like, well, like which is a security which is backed by gold? Yeah, like an ETF on gold, gold ETFs. Okay. Uh, how many of you have heard of gold ETFs? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so that's, that's great. Now, um, the question is, we've all heard cryptocurrencies. The big question is, is it a currency or not? How many of you think it's a currency? Okay. Sorry? It's a kind of currency, okay. Um, all right, so how many of you have heard of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto? Okay, so this is the person who introduced the idea of, I'm sorry, Barry, we're going to go a little bit on this, but uh, I think it's a great way to sort of, so he's actually the person who, uh, you know, put out the paper back in 2009 that introduced the the technology that's called, black, uh, that's, called digit, uh, that's called the uh, DLT, what is that? Dif what does D stand for? Distributed. Distributed ledger technology and the idea of blockchain uh, and the idea of a Bitcoin, which is a limited supply of Bitcoins that need to be mined through a computational process. Uh, and, um, and, and in a way, the, the revolutionary idea behind this is really that one could uh, engage in peer-to-peer -peer transactions without anybody else knowing about it, right? Uh, so the question is, 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 is uh, uh, and, and, and so the technology that is blockchain has many other applications beyond Bitcoin, uh, but, uh, but it's only over, so while the 2009 is the kind of the, the watershed year, it's only in the past perhaps five years that, be, that the, the investment and trading in Bitcoins uh, became such a huge rage, right? And there was, uh, there was this whole activity around uh, 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 a kind of FOMO or the fear of missing out that is actually involved in the evolution of interest in this product. Uh, and it is no longer something that, uh, that people in the fringes, people in the dark net were engaged in. It was also, it's really stuff that, uh, you know, and many of us know people uh, who have invested in Bitcoin, right? So then the question is, uh, is it a medium of exchange? Do any of you agree that it is a medium of exchange? Can you use it to undertake peer-to-peer -peer transaction? Can you use it to undertake transactions? It could be just sending money to a friend of yours, or it could be for the purchase of goods and services. Yes? Okay, do you know of anyone who's done that, who's used it for that purpose? Not really, right? Okay, um, the other question was, uh, uh, there was also this other kind of value proposition to Bitcoin, which is that, sorry, not Bitcoin, but really uh, cryptocurrencies, which is that it is uh, it is an inflation hedge, right? Just like gold, uh, uh, that uh, when the uh, when the interest rates are very low and you really want to uh, uh, control for inflation, what do you do? Uh, this is one way to kind of uh, when when the interest rates are high. Sorry, uh, this is one way to control value erosion because of uh, because of uh, uh, inflation. Um, and then we've seen that because of the, uh, the wild fluctuations in uh, the pricing uh, or the prices, uh, it is no longer an inflation hedge. It is no longer a store of value, but rather it's a very highly speculative asset. That's what it's actually boiled down to, right? Uh, and yet people are making money and it's, it's a lot more uh, akin to Ponzi schemes. Uh, and so this is really the background, right? The question is, one, is it a store of value? Two, is it a medium of exchange? Uh, and three, which is the privacy aspect. Uh, how many of us think here that uh, I don't want the government to know what I do with, with my money? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, so, the, so cryptocurrencies actually enable you to do that. Uh, but of course, the question is, what are the nature of activities that, that are being uh, sort of, that people are engaging, it, uh, engaging in, you know, on the back of this? And there, that's where it gets really murky because it's been known to be used for all kinds of uh, things and then um, so the fact that and when I say all kinds of it kind of cuts across things like money laundering, terrorism, uh, sort of tax evasion, um, uh, and um, I think mostly drug, drug peddling, uh, you know, hiring assassins. So we, we, there's a whole spectrum of things around there. Uh, so then back to the question of what do we do with this, right? Many governments across the world have thought about regulating it, but we really don't know. Uh, 
what are the big harms that we should be sort of considering? Uh, and we are talking of harms to the average consumer. Uh, so, so actually, really, we can't do, we can't kind of begin this discussion without actually what hap discussing what happened in the last few months, and especially in the month of November, right? And that's where uh, I want to kind of bring the first question to Senator Barry, uh, which is which is really we had two large collapses, right? So one is Binance, and the other is FTX. Uh, we've had uh, sort of criminal charges against the CEO of FTX. Uh, this person um, is actually, uh, and his name is Sam Bankman, right? He's actually expected to face even up to 100 years in prison. Uh, and so the question is, what is so criminal about what he has done? Uh, the second is really Binance, where uh, it's not criminal charges, but really, uh, I think the SEC in the US has really uh, find, uh, I think, up to 4.3 billion USD, as well as a $50 million penalty, a personal penalty on the CEO. Uh, and now um, the question is, uh, Senator Barry here was, in, I mean, and so the FTX, in fact, is an offshore exchange that was registered at at the Bahamas. And he was really in the middle of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, his government actually brought about a slew of measures. But so, Senator Barry, the uh, sort of really the question to you is, what did you think, what did you kind of uh, recognize as the very important harms that have uh, manifested uh, or potentially are going to manifest, which you think are important in your government's response? Uh, and perhaps if you could talk about what those responses were, that'd be great. Yes. So thank you for that. I think that's actually a really great segue. And um, this type of conference is really the ideal conference to speak about those issues because at the crux of it and the foundation of it, um, what happened with the whole FTX debacle and collapse was essentially consumer harm. Um, there's lots of other words sort of flowing around, but at the at the core of it, um, it was real big consumer harm. So, um, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, I think everybody knows what happened with FTX. Um, the CEO um, and founder of FTX um, has been indicted, charged, and um, found liable in the United States for a plethora of charges, but the main ones being essentially fraud, um, defrauding in, in defrauding investors um, in the various companies, as well as um, defrauding their their customers, and so at the base of it, um, it was fraud. Um, as a legislator, um, when you try to legislate a space like cryptocurrency, like digital assets, that's very new. You have to understand that it's sort of a living, breathing sort of organism, the sort of legislative framework. When the Bahamas in 2019 um, passed the, the DARE Act, the Digital Assets and Registered Exchanges Act, it was one of the first countries in the world um, to do so. So at that point, it was still very new and, and, and fresh. And so now looking back with some perspective um, on what has happened with FTX, what um, has happened with a few other companies, um, countries like the Bahamas, we are now in the process of amending these legislation. And so what you would see now that what we're doing in, I'll first talk about the immediate response to FTX. And so within about two days um, after the allegations were revealed on FTX and there was essentially what in, in other instances you would call a run on the bank, um, a run on FTX, the Securities Commission of the Bahamas, which is the regulatory body um, that oversees digital assets in the Bahamas, essentially stopped all operations of FTX immediately. And so the Bahamas was sort of widely praised for the very quick and decisive action. But what a lot of people um, did not realize at that point was that FTX was actually a group of companies, over 100 companies, and only one of those companies were registered and regulated in the Bahamas. And so the Bahamas really only had regulatory oversight of FTX digital markets which was the Bahamas-based company. There were over 100 companies that were in um, over a dozen other jurisdictions. And so one of the things we're seeing coming out of this space is the very complicated corporate and financial structures that these crypto exchanges use. And so um, that wasn't exactly um, known or, 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 or widespread beforehand, but 
in the wake of the fall of FTX, we see these things. And so now we see and have a sort of deeper understanding of how consumers can be harmed in that context with these very complex structures that are heavily regulated in other industries. But because crypto is so new, um, it, it hadn't been as heavily regulated. And so here in the Bahamas, we're actually in the process of a review of the legislation that would have governed um, FTX. Um, the review actually happened way before the FTX collapse. And so um, here we always see legislation as sort of living and breathing. And so FTX and that situation kind of um, promulgated us to kind of speed up um, any amendments. And so in fact, we um, anticipate that by Q1 of next year, we would sort of um, pass these amendments in, in parliament. But at the core of these amendments are really three things, a more robust rich man risk management um, regime, consumer and investor protection, and market growth and innovation. And so just touching on consumer and investor protection, um, the regulatory framework um, concerning custodial services will contain several new requirements, particularly the segregation of client assets from assets belonging to the digital asset business or other non-client assets. Um, there'll be a more robust framework regarding maintaining separate accounts to ensure clients are insulated from creditors. And where client assets are held under an omnibus agreement, the custodian or wallet provider must maintain appropriate procedures to be able to identify the digital assets and transactions belonging to each individual client. That's going to be a mammoth task for exchanges because there are thousands and thousands of clients all over the world. Um, but we do feel as though these procedures need to be in place. And these are analogous to what um, financial institutions around the world currently have to do now. Um, there will also be more robust approach to protecting other client interests. And so, for example, for digital asset businesses that are providing custody or custodial wallet services, um, such as in relation to their ability to return client assets, they have to maintain procedures to ensure continued safekeeping and accessibility of digital assets in the event of unexpected disruptions. And there are a ton of required client disclosures um, around that. We've also sort of going to buttress um, the client disclosure regimes. So there needs to be a summary of terms of the client agreement, details regarding staking protocol, details of how the digital assets are staked, details of rewards or interest to be earned through staking, um, details of any penalties, um, and, and, and a whole sort of robust um, regime. So um, I won't go into the whole sort of um, details of, of the bill as it is very voluminous, but it kind of, it kind of gives, it gives an idea um, of what we're grappling with here in the Bahamas in terms of the wake of the, the FTX fall. I think um, based on how the court case is going, it has been shown that the original DARE Act was sound and did do um, sufficient protection at the time. However, there was information that no government um, would have known at that point. And um, let's be real, the reality is that no matter what laws you have on the books, there will always be bad actors. And so it's the job of the regulators to use the legislation in place to monitor very closely these companies because bad actors exist in every jurisdiction, in every industry, and so legislation must keep a foot um, in terms of consumer protection so that when harms are identified, legislators need to be quick in identifying what those harms are and legislating for, for the future. And I think that's what we're doing here in the Bahamas. Thank you, Senator Barry. Um, where I'll come to you with more questions, but uh, but for now, I think I'll turn to Yokyo. Um, could you maybe talk, uh, and I know that there's a lot of work that you have um, sort of undertaken. What are the kinds of harms that you're seeing uh, manifest um, in sort of uh, all of the activity around cryptocurrencies? Uh, and could you please share what you found? Sure. So, um, so Consumers Korea, we did a research of our consumer complaints database on cryptocurrencies um, from dating from 2019 to 2023. And I originally presented this re piece of research at, a, um, at the World Consumers' Rights Day at, at Consumers International um, a couple of years ago. But the things really haven't changed. So essentially, the risks that we see is that crypto is the Wild West. It is still the Wild West. Many regulators have started to step in this space, 
But in terms of consumer protection, in terms of marketing of crypto, or in terms of fraud and scams that are surrounding crypto, there is still a very um, lack of regulation, um, very opaqueness on how exactly the regulations uh, will protect consumers. So one of the main risks that we saw was um, that we see, we've seen during the past few years is the volatility in the market. So crypto, basically, you've, we've all seen it. We've all seen the crashes. We saw, we've all seen FTX failing. In more closer to Korea, we saw the Luna Terra crash. Luna Terra was, um, it was marketed. It was named a stable coin. So I. I don't know what a stable coin is, but the idea is it's supposed to be pegged to one US dollar and it's supposed to be stable. But I don't know the algorithms or whatever mathematic is that is behind that um, stable pegness. So, so, but, but it sells to consumers, the term. It's supposed to be pegged to the US dollar. US dollar must be something reliable. So maybe mathematicians or these, these, um, this, these people, maybe they thought of some smart things that are safe to invest. So that is the perception that many consumers are facing when we are looking at crypto assets. Um, and also, another, what we're also seeing, even, even into 2023, we're looking at our current complete, um, complaint database, is so many frauds, scams, market manipulation. So many frauds. Just, it's, it, it's not really the cryptos that are is causing the harm, but it is the people the fraudsters who are claiming to invest um, consumers' money, investors' money in some sort of crypto, but it's not really actually going into the crypto exchanges. It's not really, money isn't really used to buy Bitcoin or any type of crypto assets. It's actually just just scam, just plain fraud. But but just because crypto is like, um, it it's marketed as a stable, um, immutable and um, transparent, decentralized, I don't know, democ democratic way of money. Um, a lot of consumers in, in Korea, elderly people, young people, they all jumped into the market in 2021, 2020, and we see a surge of consumer um, complaints in 2021 and 2022. So the range was about 200, 300 per year, but in the year of 2021, which when, was when Korea saw a huge crash in the market, we see a jump of 70, 700 complaints. So more than twice complaints during that year when there was a high level of market volatility. And another um, aspect that we see is a lack of transparency. So it's a classic information asymmetry issue. So we, all, we see this in, in, in traditional finance even in um, securities, or, or when we look back to the um, global financial crisis, there was the derivatives, of the CDOs or the CDSs that American investment banks made. And, but consumers didn't, investors couldn't understand that. And we see that again in the crypto asset investment world. And because um, we really don't know how this um, works, we don't know the so-called white, white reports? White, White papers, yes. We don't, we don't know what it is. How many of you have actually read a white paper? I'm curious. So could you understand? What? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, interesting. Okay, thank you. I'll learn from you how to <laughs> read it then. But, but in, in reality, consumers really don't read this. They, they get information from social media, from um, <laughs> Facebook friends. That's where they get their information. They don't really know what they're getting into. And another thing with, um, it, that we find is accountability gap issues. So crypto is marketed as decentralized. So, so but for, for consumers, for consumer complaints, we talk about complaints, we talk about consumer redress, we talk about who do we complain to when, when the product goes wrong. So that is one of the, what we are most focused on as consumer organizations, how do we help the consumers resolve their, their problems, their issues, and any sort of product. But for, for these crypto, so it's decentralized, and who do you go after? Do we go after the exchanges? Do we go after, I don't know. <laughs> In the, along the blockchain, it's, it's supposed to be transparent, so we could go, I don't know, it, theoretically to anybody, but, but really, it's, it's really um, 
hard to understand and we don't really don't know how, where to address our complaints. And another um, thing that we see is the vulnerability of the consumers that engage in this space. So in Korea, um, there were um, reports that said that the young people, the, the crypto investment age was like the 20s, 30s. So back in the crypto boom, there were consumers, investors, they, they they didn't have enough money to buy real estate. They didn't have money to buy a house. And there was a huge housing price boom during that period. And a lot of people were feeling the FOMO, fear of missing out. They, they needed to, there was a huge inflation. They needed to earn money, but the only accessible form of inflation uh, of investment was crypto because we, it was so access, accessible in small amounts of money. So those are the risks that we saw in Korea. And I will leave it at that and let's um, hear from other panelists. So, um, so I think, yeah, so I mean, the question to Senator Barry, right? Uh, you talked about a whole bunch of uh, sort of requirements, uh, which uh, sort of regulatory requirements, which seem to very, which seem to be very similar to, say, for example, in the investments fund business, in the securities markets business, right? Issuance of new securities. But uh, is it right if I conclude that literally anybody can issue a cryptocurrency? Right, a new coin which is not backed by anything. Uh, in fact, it has no intrinsic value. Unlike, for example, in the Bitcoin, yes, you could say, well, technically it has no intrinsic value. It's not even pegged to gold, right? So I just wanted to know what are the nature of are there any capital requirements in, in terms of an entry entry barrier that uh, that you've thought of? Um, how are you thinking about this? Yeah. So I think you actually hit the nail on the head, and so. What in, in, in the Bahamas, what we're doing is um, we're finding that digital asset businesses are, are just like any other financial services business. And so the regulatory regime that you see in the Bahamas very similarly um, sort of aligns with what you would see for investment funds, for example, or requirements that you would have for, for banks. And so there are different capital requirements. And so um, the first version of the DARE bill, it did not have a capital requirement because again, at that time, it was a new industry. Um, it was actually thought it was for small investors and you know the, the kind of idea that it was young people starting out with nothing that was sort of getting in this business. And so the idea of putting capital requirements at that point, it was put in the legislation with the ability for the government to then say what the capital requirements would be in the future. And so there wasn't a particular number at that point pegged. However, with the amendments to the DARE Act that are, that are coming, we do anticipate that there will be capital requirements. So the government hasn't released that amount yet, but the idea is that for different types of digital asset businesses um, sort of aligned in what you would see as your type of consumer base, the amount of volume you anticipate, what the coin or the asset would be backed by, et cetera, the capital requirements would be based on that. And so again, we have found in learning through this process that these businesses are essentially like any other financial business and they should be regulators, regulated as such. And so there are provisions for um, capital requirements. There are also provisions, for example, for fit and proper persons to operate the business. Um, my colleague here spoke a lot about um, what, I, what, I, what I termed as bad actors, but again, um, the idea was that anybody could start um, a, a, a crypto business. And so, because we now realize that these are at the very core financial services institutions, you have to have qualified people, you have to have honest and reliable people. And so in our legislation, there's a, a entire regime of who can operate a, a crypto business and a fit and proper person. And the Securities Commission of the Bahamas is the entity that sort of vets those persons to ensure that they're fit and proper to carry out financial a financial business essentially and so the question is okay so we, we've just talked about sort of entry barriers to running a business an exchange uh, or an or an investment fund that is based on crypto uh, i just want to kind of move on to the question of the investor itself right uh, and so we have 
typically we have a lot of sophisticated investors that are coming and putting in money i think some of the large financial institutions uh, uh, sort of multilateral uh, sorry cross border multi multinational companies which have which have all started their sort of crypto desks which have all started their portfolio uh, in cryptocurrencies but the question comes down to uh, if you're not a sophisticated investor if you're not a wholesale investor you are a retail unsophisticated investor uh, what should the nature of investor protection be in this case uh, and uh, so yorkia maybe you could talk about some of the measures that you are seeing in in different jurisdictions uh, because really the investor here is uh, someone who does not have the buffer capital to fall back on right like if m money gets lost so what's the how do we think of this retail investor as one among the universe of investors who is out there trying to invest in crypto yes yeah, so so um, I did a survey. This is just a separate from from our um, consumer research survey. So, so just to give a little background, C South Korea has passed a cryptocurrency protection law. So it's called the Korean Virtual Asset User Protection Law, and it include it includes um, many elements that Senator Barry just said, like the segregation of assets, more like bank like prudential um, regulations are in place in the law. And also, it has a securities-like um, regulation. So for example, it, it regulates market manipulation. Um, it regulates unfair transactions. Um, it regulates disclosure and such. But, but most importantly, from the consumer protection perspective, it does not regulate marketing of crypto. So marketing rules, I mean like, um, if we look at the securities regimes, or security regulations, normally the marketing um, principles would include things like um, principle of suitability, su principle of adequacy. Does the investor have the experience to actually engage in this very, um, very risky investment? And also, there is a duty to explain, duty to explain the consumer, the financial product to the consumers. And uh, there's like prohibition of misleading um, statements or unsolicited recommendations and such. So there's a huge, um, very robust consumer protection, investor protection regimes in traditional securities in most jurisdictions. But we don't see that in the Korean um, crypto law. And so if I look at across the jurisdictions, I, I am not... A, expert in EU law, so if there's anybody who has um, background from the EU, they could explain. But um, for example, EU has a markets in crypto assets regulation, Mika regulation, and it does have a suitability rule. So just to give a little um, background, uh, a crypt crypto asset provider needs to assess whether the crypto assets are suitable for the clients and the provider needs to take into consideration the consumer's knowledge and experience in investing in crypto, and also their investment objectives, risk tolerance, and further financial uh, situation, including the ability to bear losses. So I think these types of suitability rules should be in place in Korea, and they should be in place in other jurisdictions too. Because we saw the crypto is a very volatile, um, investment product, and if we think of it, um, it's like a derivative where it should be, so in Korea what we have is like, if it's a high risk investment product, um, basically consumers, investors are not allowed to trade in that category, or there is like several um, regulatory hurdles that the consumer must go through in order to engage in that type of investment activity. But for crypto, um, the only regulation was actually um, miners, cannot trade in crypto. So that was the only regulation that we had, but anybody else who could open a bank account in, in Korea, um, who could link their bank account to a crypto exchange, anybody could trade in it. And that's why, that's what I think caused the huge um, loss in, in 2021, 22, and that lead, led to a lot of consumer harm. So yes, I do think that there should be some suitability rules, marketing rules in place, and we are seeing um, regulators discussing this in several jurisdictions. 
So can I can I jump in there just for one quick second? I would like to kind of yes, um, coming to add, add to um, what is being said. So in the Bahamas, as I've said, um, we've taken an approach um, very analogous to securities legislation. And so for an initial coin offering or initial token offering, for example, there is a requirement to have an offering memorandum, which for anybody who practices securities law, if you're going to um, advertise an investment to um, the public, there's an offering memorandum that has to have a whole bunch of information in terms of who the founders of the company are, their suitability for that type of business, the address and contact information um, of the business, the objectives, and all the details of the coin offering, including how the particular blockchain works, for example. And so that is contained in our legislation. Um, but I very quickly sort of looked into the DARE Act um, as you were speaking to see if there were any was anything about marketing because i think you hit the nail on the head there very little sort of um legislative sort of um terms on the actual marketing of these products. And so I found it in our legislation. And essentially it's basically a one paragraph sort of statement that says any advertising relating to an initial token offering should be accurate and not misleading and clearly identifiable as an advertisement. And it has to be consistent with the offering memorandum. So that's what we have in our legislation here in the Bahamas, not exactly be extremely robust, but it is there. You cannot be misleading. It has to be accurate and it has to be in line with the offering memorandum that you would have submitted to the Securities Commission of the Bahamas and gotten a, approval for. So I agree with you. There needs to be sort of, um, and I think we're finding exactly what you said, a lot of the problems in this space aren't exactly from the crypto exchanges or the crypto itself, but from the bad actors, the scammers who scam people and who have misleading advertising. And so I think a lot of the consumer protection sort of starts there. One, making sure that bad actors are not allowed to have the licenses to even conduct this business. And two, to very sort of strictly regulate how these are marketed so that, you know, they're marketed very realistically. So people know um, that it is speculative, for, for example. So, Senator Barry, is the does the Dare Act or sort of components uh, related to it have language on things like appropriateness, establishing suitability uh, for the investor, the risk tolerance of the investor? Is that something that's been considered? Yeah. So there was always sort of a risk management regime, but as I said before, in the amendments that um, you know we're still going through consultation for that part of it, um, we're, we're still currently doing consultations. But yes, that that's going to be a more robust part of it. But there's always been suitability. Re requirements. So just a little quick background on the Bahamas. We're obviously an offshore financial center, one of the most heavily regulated financial centers in the world from the OECD, European Union, um, the, you know, the United States. And so the Bahamas um, of a lot of jurisdictions in the world are very particular about who you allow to do business in the Bahamas because we're a small jurisdiction. And when you have bad actors associated with your jurisdiction, it causes a lot of problems. And so um, from the very first version of the DARE Act, um, there were very stringent suitability um, requirements for the shareholders in digital asset businesses, for the directors in these companies, um, et cetera. And again, you will always have people who um, you know, get these licenses and they they don't follow the law. That there will always be that there. But I think at the core of it, um, the legislative framework always needs to be tight in terms of the suitability requirements. Right. Um, so I also just wanted to kind of spend a minute on and I mean feel free to kind of not comment on this, but uh on the marketing side of things, right, the promotion, there is a lot of influencer activity. Uh, and we're talking of the likes of, say, Cristiano Ronaldo. I think recently uh, one of his endorsements for Binance is still up on some website and he's been asked to take it down. Uh, so this kind of, what do we do about these kinds of celebrity endorsements? And it's not, it's not a problem that is unique to cryptocurrencies. Uh, so what have you seen... Uh, when it comes to just generally celebrity endorsements for marketing of financial products, but high-risk financial products, because in a way, those principles should apply equally to crypto. So in Korea, there was a, um, there was a huge backlash against influencers who were marketing products, not just financial products, but just marketing products without disclosure that they're actually receiving um, 
fees, promotional fees from the companies. So our Korean FTC, um, with the bidding of consumer organizations and a lot of citizens' um, angst across the issue, so we set up a guideline about influencers on um, operating in social media. So basically the guidelines say that um, influencers need to disclose their financial relationships from the, um, the marketing um, providers. So that said, that would probably apply to crypto um, advertisements too, if an in, um, influencer would engage in that space. So uh, where does yeah. the disclosure go up? Um, So it w if it's a YouTube, then a YouTuber would have to disclose it in the beginning of uh, of oh, their okay. yes uh, yeah. So this is this was like um, funded by by Binance, and I'm talking whatever I'm saying, whatever I'm promoting is funded by somebody, for example. So that's and and it's um, I think it's supposed to be noted in in if it's social media, it has to be posted somewhere like that. Yes, but but aside from that, um, so there, I, I just wanted to share. This is not a piece of research that I have done, but what we we at Consumers Korea we're trying to um, emulate this research, and I want to share it with you because I feel that consumer organizations um, around the world can really actually um, try doing this research in their own jurisdiction, in their own languages. So what it is is. Um, so social media platforms, they have a lot of um, Finfluencers advertising crypto. And we see this, this report, report by Beuk. They have a um, report called Hype or Harm, and it's published 2023 June. And it says the, the great social media crypto con. So it, it, it highlights the advertising that is happening on social media, and it captures a few... Um, examples, and the report essentially calls for social media companies to um, st strengthen their policies um, prohibiting crypto or financial um, advertisements in the social media and, and police them better. And, and another way, um, another thing that the report um, highlights is that we don't even need crypto laws to enforce this type of um, bad acting. We can just rely on our traditional um, advertisement laws, consumer protection laws that each jurisdiction might have. So I think that this is one of the activities that um, I ask actually consumer organizations to join. Um, so Consumers Korea, we're planning one um, to do this in Korean, in our Korean language and looking into our social media. So it would be great if um, maybe Consumers International can gather all the results so we can share um, how crypto is um, advertised throughout globally. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to kind of slightly shift gears because um, uh, the sort of the third panelist that we had, Victor, uh, was supposed to really talk about uh, other use cases of uh, blockchain, uh, but so not really cryptocurrency, but really this is the this is the technology that powers uh, powers uh, the cryptocurrency, right? Uh, and uh, and so there is um, there are I um, I believe several efforts, uh, especially in Africa, to develop um, blockchain based uh, blockchain linked. Uh, EIDs for individuals across sub-Saharan Africa, and we are talking of I think 500 to 700 million individuals, right? Uh, and uh, and that kind of a system then becomes available to governments, financial services providers, banks, uh, non-financial services uh, to really um, sort of use uh, in order to identify, in order to complete uh, KYC requirements of individuals. Uh, and the fact that uh, blockchain is immutable itself means that uh, it's tamper-proof. Uh, so so that's a really uh, a very, very high impactful potential use case, right, for the technology itself. Um, but I just wanted to also talk about, uh, and uh, and, I, and sort of like, uh, Senator Barry, feel free to talk about similar use cases that you want to, but uh, but if you don't want to, we can really talk about tokenization within financial services itself. Uh, but over to you. No, we can go ahead, but I think the, the use case that um, I was going to um, 
just just sort of mention um goes along in exactly what you're saying so also here in the bahamas we have a, CD, a cbdc a central bank digital um currency so we call it sand dollar and so that is another use in the exact same space um that we found for um the, the technology um so essentially we're using that to to track um our digital currency and so people often think that a central bank digital currency is crypto um but it's not crypto because it's actual real currency backed by a, a back back backed by the the central bank of, of a government and so similar technology is also used in that space and we're doing that here in the bahamas as well yeah no so i think uh, the what's called the cbdc or central bank digital currency seems to be an answer f- from the central banking side of things to say we don't want to lose control of uh, of the issuance of cryptocurrency itself or uh, any form of so called currency itself right because then uh, you don't you kind of lose control over monetary policy transmission the whole banking system the role of banks as an intermediator uh, for funds in the system for uh, for the for uh, ma- for making available to businesses in the real economy etc um what about like tokenization right so what is the what is really the idea of tokenization we have securities such as say stocks bonds these are the most common but uh, and then there's sort of securitized paper there's um, uh, and so there are very clear cut regulations around what what can be considered a security how does a security get created how does it get traded where are all of those recordings uh, details about all of that going to be uh, placed and there are trusted third parties or intermediaries whose job is to kind of uh, manage the a uh, sort of ability of the system to provide reliable services right when it comes to securities and uh, sort of their real, sort of their role in facilitating the real economy and the idea of tokenization uh, and of course for the for doing this service there is a fee and that fee is really the transaction cost in relation to uh, for uh, in relation to trading in securities investing in securities issuing securities right so then the question is uh, what is tokenization uh, which is really the which is really we use the we just use the distributed ledger technology but uh, in a way that you create a token for for the security so the token itself is containing all of the details in relation to that security where it got issued where it got uh, traded uh, and so the question is what is the purpose of uh, uh, is is it actually a solution that's in search of a problem the whole tokenization in financial services is there value to uh, applying the this solution of tokenization into uh, you know um uh into say for example units of mutual funds uh into stocks bonds uh is there really any uh, use case at all sorry this is a question to uh, senator barry okay okay um so th- th- this is this is sort of my more of my personal view as a practitioner and less um of of the government but um I think that we're moving into a space where we will have a, a segment of the population that will find a use. I think we may find that it may the use case may not be universal, but it may be a small segment of the financial services sort of industry that finds a use case. And so I think what we're going to see is um, a lot of um, these companies will have it as a particular asset class, for example, or a particular service that services a uh, a small segment of the population um, that would be interested in it. But in terms of sort of widespread use, I think it's yet to be seen whether that type of tokenization um, is, 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 is going to be widespread in the immediate future. Um, do you want to add anything? No, I, I don't. <laughs> All right. So I think, uh, uh that's really about it in terms of what we wanted to discuss uh my sense is that the uh that the best use case is still out there it's still not we've still not discovered it we've still not arrived at it and therefore there are i think several governments have uh, sort of initiated projects initiated funding for uh, you know for startups for uh, so centers of excellence uh, for blockchain itself as a technology to see what's the possibility out there because it is uh as big a creation as say for example the internet right so uh, hopefully but let's see let's see where this is going to go i just want to open it up uh, are there questions that uh, that are there from the audience that we could discuss Uh, 
Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned about influencers, but we also have um, like companies that are actually involved in marketing. They are not necessarily the ones who are running the Bitcoin, the coin, the, the Bitcoin or, or uh, cryptocurrencies, but they are marketing, uh, working like agents on behalf of the other companies. So you find that they are just normal companies, national level companies, but working as agents in the process where um, such cryptocurrencies fail. Where do we uh, classify them and what would be their liabilities uh, in as far as um, the consumer harm would be concerned? Uh, Yorkshire, would you like to take this question? So did you, um, I didn't get, get understand well. So, so his, crypto... his qu question is essentially, what do you do about third party uh, sort of service providers who whose uh -huh. job is to sell the, sell the cryptocurrency, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so as intermediaries to an exchange, for example, uh -huh. or to a cryptocurrency-backed investment fund, right? Uh, what is How do you make sure that there is liability that's going to continue on such uh, intermediaries if there is a crash in value, or if the, the, or if the cryptocurrency just goes bust, right? It just uh -huh. disappears. Uh -huh. So that would go to the um, prudential requirements that Senator Barry mentioned, and also what um, some legislation has in place. So. So basically, if it's a financial institution, if we look come from the traditional financial regulation, there are measures to make sure that that financial regulation has the money that the consumers have put in. It, it could be deposit insurance, it could be reserve requirements, it could be some minimum um, capital requirements. There are several measures to do that, but the way I understand crypto is that there are many, many actors that are not yet regulated in that sense. So if that that actor fails, if that, like for example, FTX, if it goes bankrupt, if, if, if the owner stole all the money and moved the money to a different account, it is a crime, but there is no way that the investors can recover their money. The money's just gone. It's just a regular, it's not a financial institution. It's not regulated like a financial institution in most cases up to now, but, but more and more countries are trying to bring that, those types of um, regulations in place to prevent that from happening. That's what I understand. Yeah, no, I think your question is so relevant even in the non-crypto world, right? Uh, when you have intermediaries trying to sell products, uh, the question is, do you send money to this intermediary who then goes and invests in, in your name? So essentially, this intermediary acts like a deposit-taking entity, but is not a deposit-taking entity. It does not have the permission to do that. Uh, it does not have the capital requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you kind of regulate intermediaries? I think this is uh, is a whole topic that I think needs a lot more attention than uh, than what's happening. Uh, plus, in the digital world, it actually explodes. The, the nature of issue, the data, the, it's not just about money flows, right? It goes everywhere. And then, like, if one of these intermediaries goes bust, what's the nature of continuity of business for the for the consumer? Uh, these are very important questions. Uh, yeah. I'll just just I'll just add to that. Um, yeah, please respond. Please go ahead. Sorry, um, Senator Barry, you wanted to comment? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So I'll just yeah. add to that um, very briefly. So um, to the person who asked the question, I absolutely agree with sort of the. The, basically the basis of your question that um, we found in the Bahamas that these sort of companies have very con um, complicated structures and often they do sort of um, siphon off the marketing of, of these instruments to, to other companies. And so I do think that there needs to be a robust sort of framework to legislate the marketing of these. But um, just to let you know what we do in the Bahamas, um, digital asset businesses are defined in our legislation and only digital asset businesses are allowed to advertise digital assets. And so where you have a third party company advertising for the digital asset business, the digital asset business um, is responsible for the content of their advertising and they are liable for that advertising. And um, they ha it has to go in line with the offering memorandum and the advertising requirements, as I said before, in the legislation. And so that's how we sort of deal with that here. Um, 
I do think that it can there's room to make it a bit more um, robust, but at the core of it, the company that is regulated, the digital asset business, retains liability for the marketing of its products. Thank you. Thanks. That's that's actually very very relevant here, uh, Jashri. Yeah, quick question about Finfluencers and, you know, what you said about the fact that they have to say up front that they're sponsored by a certain company. Uh, to what extent have you seen consumer trust then lessen as a result of, you know, that disclosure? Because it's almost like any other disclosure, you know, anybody would make, but we don't know if that's actually impacting consumer behavior. Or do you have research to say that it does? So, um, so I was going to ask our <laughs> staff, um, but we don't have any research on how those disclosures um, impact consumer um, trust on the influencers or not. But, but, but the sentiment in Korea, at least, I don't know if it resonates with other jurisdictions, but in the sentiment in Korea was undisclosed um, advertising angered the consumers a lot. So there was a huge backlash. The influencers, they... What do you call it? The su subscribers, followers dropped hugely. Their business, whatever they were promoting, failed. And they were like, basically, they were just banished from, from that, that social media for quite a while. So that it, it, was, it was greatly publicized negatively. And that, that brought the um, regulators to step in into that space. So that's what we see in Korea. But I'm not sure how it would um, work in other jurisdictions. So thank you. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So, can I have a um, question to the audience? Because <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Because <laughs> um, I know um, I, I recognize from the audience so many of you work in think tanks, who work on international finance issues, work on financial regulation, and um, so I have been trying to find more examples of marketing regulation of crypto in the international space. So what, what I've seen is, um, so for example, the BIS, they talk about prudential standards. They talk about the risks of financial institutions investing in crypto. They don't talk about consumer risks, right? And um, I know the FSB or the World IMF or whatever, those financial, um, IFIs, international financial institutions, they all talk about stability and we need to keep the financial system safe um, and cryptos, whatever risk is building in the crypto world might have implications in terms of financial stability. So I see a lot of um, research papers, principles, proposals in, the, in that aspect, but what I don't see is marketing. So, in the international, I don't know, standard setting world or international financial organizations, um, are any of you um, um, know of these discussions? So what, I've, um, what I have identified is the IOSCO, FSB, OECD, they have produced a few research on this topic about crypto mar marketing and specifically crypto consumer protection aspect. So the IOSCO reported um, report on retail distribution and digitalization in 2022. FSB did something about crypto asset um, regulation and the OECD I think has the most relevant in terms of consumer marketing. They um, re published a, re a report, um, consumer insight survey on crypto assets. So on 2019, so it looks at the consumer behavior of how consumers engage with um, invest in crypto assets. So I think that piece of research actually is the most relevant um, for consumer organizations or consumer protection view on crypto asset. But um, if you have any insights, um, so I know the World Bank or the CGAP or the, these organizations work um, heavily in financial consumer protection. I was wondering if you have any um, developments in this space, if anybody knows. <laughs> okay, no. If in the UK. Uh huh. Okay. 
uh -huh. about crypto asset investment behavior. About the behavior of consumers, so where? Uh -huh. Yeah, it, the, the reason we did it, we were talking about it yes. yesterday, was we'd seen a lot of regulators going in with yes um, with regulating crypto, but uh -huh. I was in charge of the policy at the time, and my right. concern, one of the biggest effects of regulating crypto, uh -huh. what we saw in Japan, yes. was actually an increase in the purchase of crypto. Yes. Um, so before we, before, we, before we dove into that, we just wanted to see where consumers were at. And we actually found that consumers in the UK were relatively risk averse when it came to crypto. Um, and so you know, we tried to follow, and so that tracks yes, where yes. The, the source of how they found out about the, mm -hmm. um, the asset, but also how they engaged with it, what they perceived it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, was it a speculative investment? Was it like a pension? Was it a payments rail? Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they, I think they've done it three or four yes. times. Um, yeah. But I don't think, we've got CGAP in the room as well. Have you done anything on crypto? <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, we've uh, Primarily to, to understand what are, which are the main consumer risks regarding this topic. Now and understand what could be the regulatory responses, especially on consumer protection. Uh, but the main concern that we are having is in terms of how the regulators are understanding what is the, the nature of these different products and whether they have the capacity and the mandate to, to take action on this. Um, now... Some of them are not really necessarily understanding what is their mandate, their responsibility around this topic, and if it's the banking or financial supervisor agency, or it's the Security Commission, Exchange Commission, or any other um, type of authority. But then the main point next to that is what uh, type of minimum requirements they are going to ask for the once they are regulated. But the main concern that we are just trying to say is, you know, if make consumer protection pain issues at the forefront because uh, if uh, transparency issues, for example, are not well in place, that, that will affect consumers. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Juan you. Carlos, and thanks, Anna. So I think, list parting words. Uh, we don't have a minute per head, but uh, maybe two sentences. Uh, so, Joachim, why don't you go? Um, I would love to see more consumer organizations co producing research about consumer insights, uh, investor insights in their own jurisdiction. And I would like to see more international organizations, standard setters working in this space, um, creating standards and such. Thank you. Um, Senator Barry? Yes, um, I, I just want to end with how I started um, by saying that um, my view, and I think our view here in the Bahamas, is that these types of legislations are living, breathing creatures. And I think with an industry like crypto that's growing very quickly and rapidly and changing literally by the day, I think um, organizations like Consumer International and other consumer protection organizations um, sort of need to be on the feet of legislators and regulators to constantly update and elevate legislation so that consumers are protected each step of the way. When new products are created, when new services are created, when new things are discovered, um, so that the consumer doesn't lose in, in the end. So um, that's where I would leave it at. All right. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, that's really a wrap. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the panel from behalf of Consumers International and just let everyone.